Almighty God, we thank you for getting us through another week, for all our blessings and your goodness and your mercy towards us. We thank you for what you have done in our lives to have led us along this path and given us the blessing and the privilege to be a part of it for your great mercy and your patience with us as we've been so slow to understand. Lord, we pray that as we continue to review and study and look back at the waymarks, that we would be able to trace these histories, trace these events, and be fluent in being able to teach and guide others. We ask a blessing upon this movement around the world as many are well into their Sabbath, some just beginning and some not quite there. We ask you for a double portion of your spirit on your holy day. We ask a blessing upon Elders Tess and Elder Parminder that you would ever look after them, protect them, provide for them. May you give us all wisdom courage, humility, and faith. And may we, may the desire of our hearts be to perfectly reflect your image and to glorify thee on earth. May you be with us tonight as we continue our review and bless us that we might understand. We praise you and we thank you and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Okay, so I'm pretty sure you can see the screen. Yeah. Okay, this is uh, back at the Whitestone Foundation, the Canadian camp meeting for a prophecy school. It was um, July of 2020. And this one was, we went through what we've gone through, um, the vision on the path, part one, two, three, and four. And then the lines of the revolutions and now the battle of Raffia. So I have a question for us first. What are three things that the study of the revolutions give us? Open mics, if you will. Anybody? The revolution and the counter revolution, like showing us that that there's a counter revolution afterwards. Okay, yep, that's one. Anybody else? <clears throat> I had to think because I know I had three in my mind <laughs> and I was forgetting one of them. I just got it. <clears throat> okay. Um, so actually there's four, I think, that I can think of off the top of my head. So that we can see that it's in two parts, like Christine said. There's a revolution and then there's a counter-revolution. Does anybody know when the revolution is and when the counter-revolution is? <clears throat> So when you say that question, are you referring to the past or what's going on right now? What's going on right now? I, I still have a problem with that because I don't understand which side is the revolution and which side is the counter-revolution. I don't, I don't get that part. Okay. Anybody else? What revolution are you referring to? American revolution? Yeah. Looking at, um, well, the revolutions taught us um, maybe more than four things. I only put three there, but um, I just remembered another one. Um, but they taught us the, the histories, the, the histories of the revolutions brought things into our history to teach us about our history. And one is the, that there was the, the revolutions come in two parts, that there's a revolution 
and maybe this will help you, Christine. Do you remember what the purpose of a revolution is? Is it to overthrow the established government kind of thing? Yeah, to overturn a government. Okay. Okay, so if you have a revolution and the revolution is to overturn the government, then what's the counter revolution? Put that government back in place. To try to overthrow the new one that's, yeah, that's there. Okay, so we see the revolutions in two parts, a revolution and counter revolution. So that's one thing that it taught us, that the revolution, the study taught us. Think back on the French Revolution and uh, so in the French Revolution, you had a monarchy and you had the Republic trying overthrowing that monarchy, but then the monarchy revolted and they put the monarchy back in place. Right? Who, who became the leader? I'm using the word loosely because there's another word to use for it. Yeah, because it, it depends on what time period are, are we referring specifically to Napoleon? Yes, Napoleon. Okay. Go ahead. No, you go ahead. Well, that makes it um, a little bit more confusing too, because he wasn't a monarch, but he was a dictator. And he was, um, though he became a dictator, he started as, the, as a republic fighting on that side um, sort of, but then um, he became a dictator and then they overthrew him. But then he came back for a little bit, like 100 days, part of the Republic. So that makes it all even more confusing. <laughs> <laughs> well, the key word you used. Okay. Go what was it. the key? What was the key word that we know today? Uh, um, dictator? Dictator. Okay. So the revolutions give us come in two parts, teach us about the two parts, a revolution to overturn the establishment or the government, and then um, and then you have a dictator, that's the other thing, a dictatorship set up, and then the counter-revolution is to try to overthrow that dictatorship that was put in place. Okay, so on that line, if I let me know if I'm uh, um, explaining it right or uh, understanding it correctly. So we had... Um, Antigonus and Clinton, who represented the the regular government, and then Trump and the GOP that's going on, they came in to try to drain the swamp or overturn that government. Is that is that am I understanding that part correct? And he became like a dictator. Yeah, that was the revolution to put. Um, that was the revolution. It's like civil war and revolution are the she says are the same thing. So, so you have civil war. So okay. they, they are that revolution that tried to overturn the government. The the and established a dictatorship. To, okay. Yeah. And so the counter revolution would be those Democrats, more or less, uh, that come in and try to reestablish the government. Right. Okay. To overthrow that dictatorship. Okay, okay. Okay, so so we've got two things. Um, and that dictatorship was the fourth one <laughs> that I wasn't thinking of at the time. So we have two more, if you guys can remember, two more things that came out of, of the revolutions. Think about Abraham Lincoln. Oh, compromise. I don't know. <laughs> no, not compromise. Um, Not compromise. Um, anybody else? I don't want. I don't know how to give hints on this without giving it away. Okay, so we um, we have a date for Napoleon, don't we? And there's one other one. I I think it's Abraham Lincoln, but it escapes me. But we have a date for Napoleon, right? What was the date? Is that 1798? The, the actual date, the month and the year. 
I'm going to guess November 9th. <laughs> that was a good guess. <laughs> I knew that would be too good of a clue. <laughs> so, so the study of the revolutions gave us November 9th. Uh, right. And one more thing. And if I give you that clue, you'll get it right off the bat. So strain your brains first before I um, get it. And it, it involves, I'll only give you this hint. It involves first Abraham Lincoln. And that's a, that's a really bad clue. Assassination. Did you say assassination? No, no. And that's why I said it was a really bad clue, but <laughs> without giving it away. David, were you going to say, say something? Or Kathy? Yeah, I'm thinking, is it something to do with midway or midpoints? I don't think. Yeah, that might be. Uh, I'm trying to think that through. Remember this study. I think the midways come from do come from the Civil Wars. Yes. So that would probably be another thing, but I got to think that through. Because um, midway did come from that came out of the Millerite history, and then it fits in many, many places, and one of which is the Civil War. Um, but who came in after Abraham Lincoln was assassinated? Andrew Johnson um, impeachment. Ah, there you go. Who yeah. said that? Impeachment. Yeah. So impeachment. So um, with the revolutions, the study of the revolutions that, that had the um, French Revolution in two parts, the German Revolution, the Russian Revolution, uh, the American Revolution, the Civil War. Um, and then she also broke up the French Revolution into two different sections as well, um, if that lack of a better way to say it. So, so the revolutions gave us the, um, the, that the revolution comes in two parts, an, an overturning of the a revolution to overturn the established government, and, and it brought us in dictatorship and the setting up of a dictator. And, uh, and so then you have a counter-revolution, the second part of that, to overturn that new government that was just put in place. We know that this um, that the counter revolution was um, was lost, uh, and we go forward with the dictatorship. Um, it gave us also November nine, back from Napoleon, and I think it was Abraham Lincoln. Maybe somebody remembers off the top of their head, and then impeachment gave us impeachment. Was the impeachment on November nine? I don't think so. Did you say I don't think so? Correct. I don't Correct. think it was November 9th. Correct. Correct. Like with what we're going to look at is Rafia was was Rafia was the Battle of Rafia November 9. Think about the Battle of Panium that she's been laying out. And looking at 2021 and the um, and the, the study that she did laying out the history of 2021 and Zelensky and um, Putin and Ukraine is the Battle of Rafia 2019, uh, is the Battle of Rafia November 9, 2019. Okay, we'll go ahead. Okay, so we've been discussing the revolutionary time periods. That's what um, Luke did last week and comes in two parts. You have 9-11 to November 9. So you have 9-11 and you have 11-9. This is the period of revolution. And yes, I think David said midway. Yes, so midway is in here. I struggle still to remember all the things and juggling in my head as well. So you have the midway or midpoint being 2014. What happened in 2014? Just a couple of things. What happened? Well, never mind because it's right in front of you on that one. So um, if somebody can describe it though, 2014, what do we call what do we call this? 
turning point. What was that? Turning point. A turning point. Yes, a turning point. And that was when um, uh, they blocked Barack Obama's judge appointments, which saved up a bunch of vacancies so that when the dictator that they were setting, getting ready to set in position um, came in, then he could appoint all these conservative far-right judges, as well as three Supreme Court um, far-right judges very conservative far right judges okay so then they also began to purge the republican party who was it that that um, participated in that work Mitch McConnell okay no no Steve Bannon Steve Bannon all oh, right Sessions and Miller okay Miller um this one the the blocking of the judges that was Mitch McConnell so they began to purge the Republican Party. They were blocking Barack Obama's judges. And then um, Burwell versus Hobby Lobby. Who remembers um, what that was about? The, whether the employer was obligated to offer uh, birth control to the employees, I think. Yeah. Yeah, it seems like there's something else to that that's escaping my mind right now. But yes, they. It, this was after um, Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, is that what they called it, um, came out and they were, um, site, Hobby Lobby was um, claiming that it went against their religion to provide for the health insurance, for them to provide health insurance that also provided um, birth control. Reproductive, um, I think of the way they refer to it. So, um, and RBG wrote a big dissent about that and the steps that they were heading towards by doing so. And when we think about that, it's, it's what another person does with their life is their choice. And to say that my religious convictions are, are, how do I say that? My religious conviction gives me the right to trample your rights is, is wrong. And that's basically what they were deciding. They were deciding based on their religious convictions, they're deciding for all their employees what they can can and can't have. And it's what the employees can and can't have is their personal life and their personal right to, to choose if they want to use birth control. So when we see how they're stripping the rights and using religion to do it and morality, so we're discussing the revolutionary time periods in its two parts, revolution, this period here, and counter-revolution here. Um, and remember that this period of time here, there was a, um, there was a little quiet in between and then the counter-revolution began um, May 25, 2020. So it's that first process which the United States establishment was overturned and you have a dictator here, but was Trump a dictator in 2016? Yes. 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 So when you get here, what changed? You just became more of a dictator. Right. Less restrained. So then we mark 2020 is the beginning of the counter revolution. So she left that study to one side and, um, and then she asked people, what were you expecting to see on November 9? So what were people expecting to see on November 9? Impeachment. Impeachment. So when it comes to November 9, people had various answers. One of the answers was that uh, it would be when we would see presidential impeachment. And that's actually one of the things that Jeff attacked um, this movement for after November 9 uh, was that the presidential impeachment didn't occur that day. And he would say it didn't occur at all. 
but that's just a very simplistic, basic misunderstanding of what impeachment is. So we went into this, many of us, maybe not all of us, into the idea that um, impeachment would mean that he's thrown out of office, but that's not always the case. He can be impeached and still remain in office. And it also, impeachment wasn't a day, um, it was part of 2019. And it was, um, I think she marks it, I wanna say November 9, what am I trying to think here real quick, trying to remember a point she makes. Um, when, when the Senate voted against it, that that more firmly established, if I'm phrasing that correctly, more firmly established him and, and unrestrained him. <clears throat> so if we were to go back to how that study was developed, it was where you have 1865. 1865 was the, right here, 1865 was the changing from a president who freed the slaves, Lincoln, to a pro-slavery, Johnson. So you have in 1865, you've got Lincoln, who is a, um, who is um, freed the slaves. And then you go to Johnson, who was um, pro-slavery. Then you have the death of Abraham Lincoln and the beginning of President Andrew Johnson. So in 1865, um, plus 151 takes you to 2016. So using the 151, where do we get the 151 from? Say that again. Somebody is really quiet. The many, many tekel yafarsin. Yes, yes. From the from the twenty five twenty. Yes. And uh, okay, so from eighteen sixty five, you count one fifty one, and you get to twenty sixteen. The end of Obama, the Obama the Obama president presidency ends here. Who was for equality, and the beginning of Donald Trump, who's against equality. So you can see the 151 also in the same context explain 2016 in that process. So you've got a pro-slave, uh, a, um, a president that freed the slaves and a transition to one that is pro-slavery. 151 later, years later, you have a president that um, uh, that is about equality, that supports equality, is uh, it, it, it based is trying to think of the right way to say that, <laughs> for equality. And then you have Trump, who is not for equality. But then you can also see three years later, 1868, Andrew Johnson, he was favored the South. He has favored the South to such a degree. He's fired someone he shouldn't have. He's misused his power as president, and they try to impeach him. So in 1868 is when they try to impeach him. And if you take 1868 plus the 151 again, it takes you to 2019. And it's a neat study that explains more than 2019 and that impeachment. It takes you back to 1865 and shows you the change in these presidents. But that study never links to November 9. And I don't believe that link was ever made in the presentation. So there was a misunderstanding where some people thought that impeachment should happen on November 9. So when she's laying out the revolutions, November 9, we can see here, we've got the date from the German Revolution, we've got the date from the Russian Revolution, and we've got the date from the French Revolution. And it was 1794, I think uh, Christine said 1798, it was 1794. So, but this didn't, the November 9 is what taught us about dictatorship. So we know that in 2016, he was a dictator. And we've got four progressive steps, um, 2016, 2019, Panium, and then fully dictatorship at the Sunday Law. So you see here that 1865 to 2016 is 151 years apart. You have a president that is um, frees the slaves. And over here at 2016, you have a president that is for equality. And then you go from, from this one that freed the slaves to a pro-slavery and 151 years later, you have Trump at 2016. Then 1868 gives us the impeachment of the, the, um, the impeachment of Andrew Johnson and 2019 gives us the impeachment of Donald Trump. 
but it's not based on November 9. November 9 gives us the dictatorship. So the study that gave us November 9 is the story of revolutions, which we just kind of covered. When we think about the revolutions, what's the context and what's the theme? Anybody? So we're going to go back to the World Wars and look at World War I and World War II. And on, for World War I and World War II, how many fronts do they exist on? I know we know that one. So when you say how many Two. fronts? East and West. Two fronts, Eastern and Western. Okay, go ahead, Phil. Right, so yeah. If you're talking, I can't hear you. Yeah, I was gonna say that Germany was faced with the Eastern Front and Western Front. Right, right. So World War World War One and World War Two, they had they were fought on two fronts. There's an Eastern Front and a Western Front. The Eastern Front in World War Three, the one that's facing our history through today, is Russia and the United States. So World War Three, the Eastern Front is Russia and the United States. The Western Front is taking place in the United States. And that's this. Um, Civil War uh, Revolution. So, in um, <clears throat> so the United States versus the West, and the United States is part of the West. So, in many ways, it's the United States versus the United States, which is what and that's civil war. When you have a nation fighting within, divided and fighting within, it's a civil war. So, when we do the study of revolutions, we're speaking about the Western Front. So, the revolutions are giving us the Western Front. The studies of the revolutions, which gave us November 9, is a study of what is happening on the Western Front of World War III. <clears throat> November 9 is a Western Front subject internal to the United States. So, it's this establishment of a dictatorship, and it's the Western Front of World War III. So, you have World War I plus World War II equals World War III. Um, and there were two fronts, an Eastern and a Russia, and a um, Western. Eastern is uh, Russia versus the United States, and Western is the United States versus the United States. So when we look at November 9, we have to first understand November 9 is a Western front, not Eastern front. And she wants to put a spin on that because you're going to go back to 1989 is described as a battle. We don't have 1989 on the board, but 1989 is a battle. We know that that was the, um, the collapse of the wall and collapse of Soviet Union. So um, <clears throat> November 9 for 1989 is November 9 for one other history that we have taken to these revolutions. And we said 1989 and 2019. So you have a November 9 at uh, 1989, and you have a November 9 at 2019. 1989 was a battle between the United States and the Soviet Union. 2019 is a battle between the United States and Russia. November 9, 1989, November 9, 2019. So we agree that November 9 is a subject of the Western Front Civil War, the United States versus itself. But then we went back to 1989, Rafia is a battle in Daniel 11. 1989 is a battle in Daniel 11. And 1989 is November 9. So I know that sounds really probably confusing. November 9 gives us dictatorship, comes from the study of the revolutions, and it's, um, it's the um, Western Front, the United States versus the United States, civil war in the United States. But then you have this issue of 1989 being a battle with the Soviet Union, and it's also November 9. 
and when you come to um, the Battle of Raphia as well, that's part of Daniel 11. It's also November 9, or also, um, yeah. Then we went back to 1989. Rafi is a battle in Daniel 11. 1989 is a battle in Daniel 11. And 1989 is November 9. So Rafi is not November 9. Sorry, I think I started to say that way and I didn't mean to. <clears throat> so I want to suggest the way that I view this, and this is Elder Cass. 1989, to change your mindset for a moment, you're no longer a citizen of whichever country you come from. To keep it simple, you're no longer a citizen of the United States because that's the context we're viewing this in. You're now a citizen of the Soviet Union. Place yourself in the mindset of a citizen of the Soviet Union. And now how do you see November 9? Where is the United States, November 9, 1989? Anybody? United States nowhere. is not there. It's silent. Yeah. So it was a battle between the United States and the Soviet Union, but the United States was not there. And it's not there. What happens on that day, what happens through 1989 is revolutions through the Soviet Union. It's internal civil war. So you have revolutions in 1989, internal civil war in the Soviet Union. The United States was not there. They weren't there themselves forcing the people to break down that wall. They weren't themselves there breaking it down. That was happening inside by citizens of the Soviet Union. It was destroyed from the inside. And where was the United States? <clears throat> not even there, not even visible. So why is it described as being a battle between the United States and the Soviet Union? Anybody? Subterfuge. Subterfuge. Anybody else? Is it a proxy? You say proxy, is that what you said? Mm -hmm. So describing 1989, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the Soviet Union started falling apart, turmoil and struggle inside the parliament. Someone says because of their prior history, that was somebody in the chat, says because of their prior history. So what do we know the United States had done before 1989? Before 1989, they've already, through the Afghanistan proxy war, through the Voice of America and subterfuge, which uh, Phil said, through working with John Paul II, through the arms race, through all of these different ways, they've already maneuvered to bring the Soviet Union to its own place of civil war. Can you see that with Russia and what Russia did has done in the United States now? So they weren't there, but all that was going on prior to was a work of the United States that, that helped to bring about civil war in Russia. So they had manipulated events surrounding the Soviet Union to cause its own people to rise up against it. What you're seeing in 1989 is an internal civil war. It's the Soviet Union versus the Soviet Union. That's what you see, but you know that the United States played a role in bringing that about. So when you see Western civil war inside the United States, Western front here, civil war, the United States versus the United States, who brought that about partly? Who works through disinformation campaigns? Russia. Russia. So on the day you see them, it just looks like an internal civil war, pure Western front. But you know by the prior history that it has been influenced by Russia, by the King of the South. So Russia plays a role in bringing about civil war in the United States. Bringing it to where it's at today. So for the people that said before that they expected to see Russia on the day, you wouldn't see Russia, November 9, 
on the day, but you are correct that you know that Russia has had involvement in that. Trump became president with the help of Vladimir Putin. That change in overthrowing the American establishment happened through Russian assistance to Vladimir Putin, through Russian disinformation campaigns, and through the work of the Internet Research Agency, which I always thought was <laughs> um, interesting. Now, when you look at the Battle of Heraclea, I actually, when you go back to, I think it was May, maybe somebody remembers the date, but I think it was May 2017, um, the first year of his presidency when he established, and I can't remember what it was called, but it had to do with, I'm um, uh, talking about Trump, had to do with the um, internet securities um, to try to control, eventually coming to the place of the Battle of Heraclea where it would be that we would fight offensively against internet attacks. If anybody remembers those details, um, I don't remember the details, um, all the details, but um, but the, in so Trump gets Trump is helped by the disinformation campaigns of Putin and all that he has done. Um, to bring about this civil war that brought to the place of being able to, for Trump to be elected. And yet once he's elected, you know, you see him be friends with Putin, but at the same time, he's working against Putin. And one of the things that they did was shut down the internet research agency as well. So from one perspective, this is the Western front of World War III. We're observing through these revolutions the progressive steps of the Western Front of World War III, just from another perspective, but the same thing. But it's also equally correct to say that that civil war is a result of influence by the King of the South. Therefore, so the civil war is um, partly from the influence of the King of the South, just like in 1989, the civil war in Russia was influenced by. The United States. Therefore, that internal civil war is a battle between North and South, just as the internal civil unrest in 1989 was a battle of Daniel 1140 between North and South. We can see how our history is complex. We need these different perspectives to approach the subject. If you just look at it from one perspective, the application will be too narrow. You can say it's Western Front and be correct. You can say it's a battle between North and South, which looks like Eastern Front, and you would be correct. It's understanding that there are these two fronts, looking at both of them and that both combined, and she's talking about what she tried to describe in Brazil in 2019, um, is that our lines, they have a, a component of being three-dimensional. And whiteboards, as good as they are, you don't, you're not able to see three dimension. You're only seeing it two dimensionally. So there is a limit. And our message, actually, if we really conceptualize even just this one thing, it's not a two dimensional subject. Which makes me again think about Ezekiel and the wheels within wheels and trying to hold all this in our minds. So um, I wish technology had advanced to that stage, the sci-fi movies where they press a button and you walk in and through your projection. It actually is more of a 3D model than a 2D. And we're working off the lines and whiteboards that only give us two-dimensional images. And that's part of the battle we have to work through. When it comes to November 9, last year, it is Western Front and Eastern Front but in a different way. This isn't something visible like the United States and the Soviet Union fighting over Cuba, fighting over a different country, fighting over Afghanistan. It's something that occurs internal to the Soviet Union itself. It is an internal civil war. So there, is those two, there are those two components. There is the fight um, spheres of influence that relates to other countries outside the Soviet Union, but under their influence, countries like Afghanistan and Cuba. November 9 relates to what 
what's happening inside the Soviet Union, but because of the influence America has already exerted to cause civil unrest inside the Soviet Union, it is a battle between North and South. It is an Eastern Front as well. I don't know if you guys are, is anybody having troubles understanding that? Are you all following? Okay. Yes. So you have a Western front and an Eastern front. November 9 is a Western front story, but we also see 1989 when we see the influence the United States had in 1989 to bring about civil war. So we see that, that the influence that Russia has had to bring about civil war in the United States. I think I said that right, and I hope I didn't reverse something. I just want to give us that understanding of November 9. I don't have an explanation of November 9. I don't have that to give to you. I'll just I'll justify that by saying that on the lines, we don't. The disciples don't understand the cross for some time. That is our key reform line more than any other. Six, the success of ancient Israel, the success of modern Israel, even when Christ descends, why are they so disappointed when Christ ascends? It's their increase of knowledge after the cross. Why are they disappointed? If Christ goes back to heaven, how is he going to lead them against the Romans? They're so disappointed at the ascension because they still don't understand what happened at the cross. And where's the cross marked on another line? Where's the cross marked? On our line, where do we mark the cross? 2019. 2019, yeah. So they're still disappointed after the cross. They don't understand what happened. And it's characteristics of that dispensation. So what we need to do is understand what we're supposed to see when we do understand it. It will not relate to the impeachment. It will not relate to anything visible with Russia over external spheres of influence. It's internal to the United States. It's the end point of an overturning of an establishment, which Russia played a role in helping. And I know that's complex. It's having a few different points, as, as I said, three-dimensional, different perspectives that we need to be able to pick up, look at, and put back down. It's Eastern Front and Western Front. It's internal civil war influenced by the enemy. So the issue of the, the Eastern Front and proxy wars is separate and distinct from the work of on the Eastern Front of Russia um, interfering with the United States to bring about civil war and help establish be, play a role in the establishment of a dictatorship. So two separate things to think about at the same time, or more than two. So I want us to briefly look at what else happened in 2019. We should have expected multiple things. First, the restraint of radical Islam, is, Islamic terrorist groups. And I need to all of us to have to um, help each other to remember this because I know that I've done it, referred to it as um, the restraint of Islam. So when we're working on our studies for 9-11, let's try to remember that. We're not looking at the restraint of Islam. We're looking at the restraint of radical Islamic terrorist groups. It was the restraint of radical terrorist Islamic groups, ISIS, the defeat and the death of Baghdadi and the conquering of the Islamic State, all of its territory, and the restraint was fulfilled. So that's another thing in 2019. You have the restraint of radical Islamic terrorist groups. We would expect to see an impeachment of the US president, neither event connected to November 9, and we did see that occur, we have the restraint of radical Islamic terrorist groups. Osama bin Laden's son was killed as well. And that was quite a restraint put upon ISIS, including losing all of the last remnants of their territory. 
we have the impeachment that we would expect to see. We also have a fight over spheres of influence between the United States and Russia, external to what's happening inside the United States. The fight over spheres of influence was not connected to November 9. This fight over this the fight over spheres of influence. Um, I think how to ask that question. What would we call that fight? The fight over spheres of influence. I have a question. Yeah. So uh, underneath underneath the waymark of 9-11, it says German October 1918, Russian 1917, it says French 1989. Supposed to be 1789. Probably. Yeah. Typo. Sorry about that. I'll have to fix that later. So, um, so what's the fight over? What do we call the fight over the spheres of influence? What about that the proxy war? Say that again. The proxy war. Wouldn't that be the proxy war? Yes. And there's another another term that I'm looking for with it. What did we learn early on 2019? What do we call 2019? So yes, proxy wars. Raffia. Okay. Huh? Rafia? Rafia, yeah. So the Battle of Rafia is the proxy wars, the, the spheres of in, the fight over the spheres of influence. And it wasn't connected to November 9. It was a um, the, basically the, the year of 2019. So when it comes to Rafia, Rafia was a fight over what country, what territory in its literal history? What was that fight over? Was that um, Syria? Syria, coal Syria, the fight over coal Syria. So you had these two generals, North and South, Babylon and Egypt, fighting it out over the territory of Syria. They both wanted to control that external sphere of influence. So when it comes to Rafia, I wanna suggest Rafia as a name is more than November 9. Rafia is a fight over external, external to the civil unrest, so separate, from the civil unrest, external to the revolution, all the spheres of influence is what it's over. So that is what Rafi is about, the spheres, the battle over spheres of influence. So we're gonna start looking at some maps. I wanna lead us through a little bit of history, why these spheres of influence are so important. And what was FS, FFA's position on Rafia? The issue that they had with Rafia is that they cannot look outside the United States. Um, because FFA, their worldview is so encased in nationalism. It's so nationalistic, they cannot look and see the importance of events in other countries. And this has hindered them being able to see the external events of Rafia. Rafia was a fight over coal Syria. It was an it was external to Babylon. It's external to Egypt. It's a fight over who controls the strategic region of the world. So you have Syria here, and Babylon was in here, if I'm correct, if I'm right. Tell me if I'm wrong in here. Babylon was in, I think it's right in here. And then you have Egypt down here. Well, the city of Babylon, but it was the northern up here. That, um, but Syria was strategic to both of them, and they were fighting over Syria. They were fighting over a sphere of influence. So 2019, there are multiple strategic areas, and this is outside of November 9. This is Rafia, the Battle of Rafia, which is outside of November 9. Rafia is not the day. Rafia was the year. 
and I want us to see the importance of these spheres of influence. We've discussed before this territory of Syria here, and I'll just quickly review why this is a place of such strategic importance. If you look down, you have Saudi Arabia down here, and then you have Iran over here. Saudi Arabia and Iran are mortal enemies. Iran is Shia, and Saudi Arabia is Sunni. So we've got Shia and Sunni here. It's not just a religious divide. It has become a political issue because whoever is right in that ideology as it relates to Islam, <clears throat> whichever country or government is right about Islam, that country then has the authority to rule these two um, areas, this Mecca and Medina is in here too. Just wasn't on this map, but Mecca and Medina are right here. So these are the two holy sites um, in the Muslim, holiest sites in the Muslim religion and in Islam. So if Iran and Shia Islam is correct, Iran says the House of Saud, this government of Saudi Arabia, does not have the religious right to control Mecca and Medina. So this is about legitimacy as a world power, as a government. So Shia here and Sunni here, and the fight is over who's going to control these two holy sites. And if Iran and the Shia is correct, then it's their right to rule these sites or vice versa. So this is about legitimacy as a world power, as a government. This is, a, this is the church-state union that began to come together much more forcefully in 1979. So a union of church and state between, um, whether it be Sunni, we saw the Iran revolution, which brought in the Ayatollah Khomeini, is that how you say his name? Um, so the Shah of Iran was overthrown. And now you have church state, and then you also have a church state here. These are mortal enemies, and these two themselves fight over spheres of influence. So Russia supports Iran, and the United States supports Saudi Arabia. And in here, you have another country supported by the United States, and that's Qatar. So Russia supports Iran, and the United States supports um, Saudi Arabia, and Qatar is a US ally. Qatar has access to oil from the Persian Gulf, and they wanted to build a pipeline, and it would have had to go through from here to Iraq, um, through Syria, and then into Europe. So for this little country, Qatar, an ally of the United States, to build a pipeline from the Persian Gulf into Europe, it would have to go through Iraq and Syria. Iraq is okay with that. They're quite controlled by the United States by this stage. So the pipeline would have to go through Iraq, through Syria, through Syria into um, Europe. You don't want to go down through this territory of Lebanon and Israel. There's too much unrest. You need to go through Syria and then through Turkey. Turkey is a U.S. ally when it wants to be. It's acting like a rebel without a cause at the moment, but it wouldn't be a major problem. The problem is Syria. Because who is Syria allied to? Syria is allied to Iran and Russia. So when Qatar wants to build this pipeline through Syria, or through here, then Syria blocks it. And this is the history of 2009 to 2011. Iran has also has access to the Persian Gulf, and it wants to build a pipeline that will go through Iraq and through Syria under the Mediterranean and come out in Europe. So um, Iran, uh, Iran has access here to the Persian Gulf. They want to build a pipeline, and they need to go through Iraq, through Syria, then the Mediterranean, and into Europe. Iraq doesn't have a problem with it. Um, Syria now has no problem because they're allied by Russia. They're supported by Russia. Syria has no problem because Iran is supported by Russia. Syria is supported by Russia. They have the same strategic interest. So you have Syria and Iran backed by Russia. And so, they, so Russia and Syria are okay with this pipeline going through here. So I wanted to build, I, Iran wanted to build this pipeline 
And Syria said, that's fine, go ahead. And that was around 2010. One year later, you have Arab Spring, the Syrian civil war begins. So that is why Syria is so, such a strategically important location. It was a gateway to all of this territory back when coal Syria was a little bit more north of that. It was the gateway to this breadbasket. It was also the crossroads between Egypt and Babylon because this was desert. So you have all this desert here and it was the, um, the way to, to get um, from Babylon down into Egypt. Let's see. But it remains a place of strategic importance today. If you wanna have access from this area, rich in natural resources, all the oil and re natural resources and gas, through um, into Europe, who wants to use and buy those natural resources from you, the route, the route goes through Syria. So whoever controls Syria controls who gets to send natural resources through to Europe, which is a major amount of resources. So this is why there is a sphere of influence fought over, sphere, over Syria. Can somebody repeat some of that back, summarize that? You have Iran and Saudi Arabia. What's the issue between Iran and Saudi Arabia? So you have Saudi Arabia, who's Sunni. Okay. And you have Iran, who is uh, Shia. And they are mortal enemies. And so the, the two house of worship, Mecca and Riyadh, they're, they're fighting over the, the, the right to rule whether it be a Shia rule or a Sunni rule over those uh, two sites, uh, Mecca and Riyadh. Um, that's Medina. one issue. Medina, that's Medina, not on the map, yeah. sorry. Oh, yeah, sorry. Medina, okay. <clears throat> and then the other issue is about the, uh, the oil, uh, oil going to Europe. Uh, and to go to go to Europe, it has to go through Syria. So Syria is um, allied with Iran and Russia. Okay. So, uh, but Qatar, who wanted to build a pipeline, also has to go through Iraq and Syria. But Syria said no. So that pipeline uh, from Qatar uh, was, was um, disrupted by Syria. And then the, the pipeline from Iran was also going to go to, to, through Syria. And Syria said, OK. So. So Syria becomes a very a crucial point of control. So whoever controls Syria controls the, the oil through the pipeline, which goes to Europe. Yeah. Which gives, uh, I don't know the right words for it, strategic power, I don't know, or power and influence from, for Russia to be able to control the resources of Europe. So they blocked the United States from being able to, um, United States and Qatar from being able to get um, oil in there, which would then hurt Russia. And that was, I remember that was one thing, one of the things that Obama was trying to do was to, and I think others as well, to have more control over oil in Europe, the resources in Europe, and to keep um, Russia at bay. If, I don't know if that's the right way to say that. Thank you. So I want us to come back out of the subject of Syria and just um, have us briefly look at a couple of others. We'll come down to Yemen down here. And uh, so what do we know about Yemen? 
And I'm going to read a little from the Center for Strategic and International Studies. I don't agree with his perspective. He writes from a very nationalistic American perspective, but he explains why Yemen is so important. Yemen is a growing reminder of just how important the strategic US partnership with Saudi Arabia really is. This area of Yemen developed into civil war and it has been controlled by outside proxies from early, early in, particularly Saudi Arabia and Iran, early on. Um, Saudi Arabia and Iran support different sides of the Yemen civil war. So there's a civil war going on in Iran and uh, Saudi Arabia support different sides of the civil war. So these two powerful Middle Eastern countries are wrestling it out over who can control Yemen. So Iran and Saudi Arabia are fighting over who can control Yemen. And I hope we can start to see why this area is such strategic importance, particularly through the early days of this war. While America didn't become directly involved, what they did was American planes would take off from their bases in Saudi, from uh, Syria, and they would take off from their bases in Iraq. They would fly down into Saudi Arabia, air, Arabian airspace, they would meet midair with the Saudi Arabian fighter jets. They would refuel, refuel them, the, the jets, and then those fighter jets would fly down and conduct bombing in Yemen on behalf of Saudi Arabia. Arabia. So the United States has taken off from their air bases and meeting midair with Saudi Arabian fighter jets to refuel them so that the Saudi Arabian fighter jets can go down here and bomb Yemen, putting the United States responsible. So that's just one example where the United States was supporting Saudi Arabia in that proxy war over Yemen. The side that was in Yemen, that was the side of Saudi Arabia and being supported by the United States, this human life loss, the casualties due to the Saudi Arabian bombing was so horrific that Obama, because this happened in the Obama administration, Obama was warned, if you keep supporting Saudi Arabia in this proxy war, the UN will be forced to charge the United States with war crimes. The human casualties were horrific. And if anyone from Europe wants to know why there's refugees flooding up from Yemen, this is one example. At one stage, it was the greatest humanitarian crisis in the world, millions on the brink of starvation. So Obama had to start to pull back um, there, but he still supported Saudi Arabia. And of course, Russia is um, supporting Iran in Yemen. So quoting from the Center for Strategic and International Studies, he puts Yemen in a broader strategic context. Quote, the crisis in Yemen is only part of the U.S.-Saudi strategic equation, end quote. So this all relates to this alliance between Saudi Arabia and the United States. And quote, at the same time, Yemen is of major strategic importance to the United States, as is the broadest stability of Saudi Arabia and all the Arab Gulf states. Here you have the Strait of, um, let me go back one. I think she goes into this more, a little bit more but it has to do with being able to come up through here as well. So here you have the Strait of um, Horm Horm Hormuz. This is hugely strategic. You would note, I think, even in the early months of this year, Iran was attacking tankers that went through this. Uh, it's something that they practiced in 1997 as well. It's been a practice of theirs that when they want to push for more global influence, when they want to punish another country, they start covertly attacking the oil tankers that are forced to travel out of the Persian Gulf and around this point. So Iran controlling this choke point can cause a great deal of problems for the United States and for allies. So coming out of the, the ships, the tankers that come out of here, um, it's a strategic place for the tank, for the oil to be brought through. Yemen does not match the strategic importance of that Gulf, but it is of great strategic importance to the stability of Saudi Arabia and the Arabian Peninsula. So this here, the Arabian Peninsula here. Um, Yemen also became the base of Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, in the Arabian Peninsula. Then, 
he goes on to describe the strategic importance of the Strait of Babel Mandeb, which right here, um, it's a traffic point between the Horn of Africa and the Middle East. So my understanding, because I was looking into this, I don't know my geography well, and I was always thinking that horn was down here, and I don't know what you call this area here, but it's this here that we're talking about. So you have the Horn of Africa, let's see. Um, it's a traffic point between the Horn of Africa and the Middle East. It is a strategic link between the Mediterranean Sea and the Indian Ocean. The strait is located between Yemen and this Horn of Africa. It connects, it connects the Red Sea with the Gulf of Aden. You got the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden, if I'm saying that right, and the Arabian Sea. Most exports, uh, let's see, in the Arabian Sea here, most exports from the Persian Gulf that transit the Suez Canal, they have to pass through here. So this is a um, smaller map. Let's go back. Yeah, when they come out of the, um, when they come out of the Persian Gulf, it's talking about this area here. So when they come out of the Persian Gulf, they want to go up through to the Su Suez Canal. So let's see, most exports from the Persian Gulf that transit the Suez Canal, they have to pass through here. So if you want to come around here and through, through it up to Europe, you're going to have to go through this choke point as well. So this is another um, choke point and strategic as to who controls it because they want to, they come out of the Persian Gulf down through here to go up through here to go through the Suez Canal and into Europe. It's 18 miles wide at its narrowest point, limiting tanker traffic to a two mile, wild, two mile wide channels, two mile wide channels for inbound and outbound shipment. So a two mile wide channel for inbound and a two mile wide channel for outbound. Closure of that area would keep tankers from the Persian Gulf from being able to go through the Suez Canal or Sumed, um, Sumed, the pipeline, having to divert them all around through the southern tip of Africa. Any hostile air or sea presence in Yemen could threaten the entire traffic through the Suez Canal. So when you have these proxy wars, Syria is strategically important. Yemen is strategically important. So I think this, because I remember looking that up, and I think I added that to it, that this is that Sumed pipeline right here if I remember right. So we're looking at the whole map up here and you see the um, Africa, you see the Horn of Africa and the strategic point here to get the oil up and then to Europe. So Yemen is important. We see Syria is important. We see um, um, not on this, yeah, on this map right here, this little tiny spot right here also coming out of the Persian Gulf. Moving on to another one, you have Libya next. Libya is a major issue, um, a major concern. So first, who messed up Libya? This is Obama and Clinton. They overthrew Gaddafi and stopped that job badly. So since 2011 and the overthrow of Gaddafi, it has been just been a brutal civil war, thousands of people suffering and dying. Again, when you have a refugee crisis, it's also the civil war here. Quickly, the West and Russia took different sides in the civil war. The UN supported with the US's agreement, a government that they set up in Libya, but Moscow supported the rebel commander, Khalifa Haftar. So you have Russia supporting this rebel commander, Haftar, Haftar and, the, and the UN and the United States supporting Tripoli, the Tripoli government. And they're fighting over this um, country, here, Tripoli, they're fighting over um, Tripoli. So Haftar, with the support of Russia, controls the vast majority of the country, but the government controlled the capital and this territory up here, which was a particular strategic importance. So over the last years, this has been another fight over spheres of influence. Why does Russia want their guy in charge of Libya? Why do they want Libya? So who has who who maybe has an answer for why Russia wants Libya?
So the U.S. in agreement with the U.N. Um, controlled this this area here in the government, while um, Russia supports uh, the rebel Haftar. And why? Well, uh, I'm going to take a guess. Okay. Um, maybe it has to do with oil again. Um, control of the ports. Uh, control of the Mediterranean Sea. Um, I don't know. Any of those sound reasonable? They do, but um, um, but I don't. That's not. That's not the answer. Um, from what I'm remembering, if they get if they get Libya, what else do they get? What was the issue over Afghanistan in '79 to '89? This looks different in the history of the Cold War. The Soviet Union came down through much of this territory. In Af so Afghanistan was of strategic importance, particularly because it was called the soft underbelly of the Soviet Union. So you don't so, want it, huh? So they're closer to their um, enemies. Right. Right. That's why they're, isn't he, that's why he wants Venezuela and places like that so he's closer to the US. Right. And you don't want your enemy to get that close. Right. That's why he has a problem with Ukraine. Right. Exactly. So Afghanistan was was of strategic importance particularly because it was called the soft underbelly of the Soviet Union. You don't want an enemy government having influence over your soft underbelly. So what's Libya directly under? If Vladimir Putin has Haftar succeed in Libya, take over the whole country, he has the soft underbelly of actually the whole NATO alliance. He already has air bases situated in Libya. He has troops on the ground. Um, he sent in his own covert soldiers, his own drones, his own tankers and bombs. He's already set up Russian air bases inside Libya in preparation. So it would. Um, Put him with uh, all of NATO um, on his doorstep. The strategic importance of that location beyond the influence of any wealth or economic deals is again its location. It divides East and West Africa at this top juncture and Vladimir Putin is also forging ties within Africa, particularly with Sudan, but Libya is of strategic importance because of its coastline of the Mediterranean and it's directly under NATO alliance. So that's part of what um, Fell was saying as well, the coastline and the ports. The issue after World War II, Stalin said, we just fought an enemy that forced his way all the way to our doorstep. We need to have some spheres of influence between Germany and the Soviet Union. These are just paraphrases that she was um, putting in here. So that we have a buffer zone, like an airbag, if anyone tries to hurt us, we have these airbags here that they're not on our doorstep. Everyone wants an airbag. It's the issue with Afghan. It's the issue with Afghanistan. It's the issue with Libya. If Ukraine wants to side with NATO, what's Russia's complaint? You're going to bring NATO to the very border of Russia. So what's he going to do? He's trying to do the same thing. Have his influence as close as he can to NATO as well. We'll touch on one more and then we'll move on. So we looked at um, we looked at the Persian Gulf. We looked at Qatar, Iran, and Saudi Arabia and the battle over Medea and Mecca, um, both being a church state um, established into a um, church state relationship in both of them by 1979. You see that Russia controls Iran and Syria you see that the United States controls or controls or allied with is a better way to say it allied with uh, Saudi Arabia and also Qatar. Qatar wants to take a pipeline to be able to support and they're backed by the United States to be able to take a pipeline, build a pipeline to go into Europe, which would cut off the resources for um, less power for the, for Russia. Um, but they could not go through Syria. Um, because Iran and Syria are allied together and then with Russia. So they would not let it happen. So Iran wants to build a pipeline 
and um, and go through Syria and then through the Mediterranean and on up into Europe. And Syria um, says yes, okay. So that gives um, edge over uh, for Russia. So the two strategic points here that we looked at were um, this, and I can't remember, Strait of Hormuz, I think is what it's called. And then also down here where you have going in from the Arabian Sea to the Sea of uh, Aden Sea, as I would said, and then into the Red Sea. So going through the um, Horn of Africa and in through this. So the two choke points here that you that are strategic of strategic importance for the oil transfer and this one here to take it on up into here. Then we saw Libya as um, um, Russia wants to be here so that he doesn't so that um, it's so that it's not a place um, controlled right there by by NATO. Hope I said all that right. <laughs> okay, so then you have Venezuela down here. Venezuela has clearly been a fight for spheres of influence between the United States and Russia. It's partly economic, the economic advantage that Russia has over Venezuela, the deals they've made with President Maduro that greatly favored Russia, the millions that they have loaned for that country that they won't get repaid unless Maduro stays in power. That's all part of it. But one Russian politician said, quote, if the U.S. wants to come to Ukraine and have a sphere of influence right on our doorstep, we're going to do the same to them. Another paraphrase. So if the United States wants to go to Ukraine and be on the doorstep of Russia, then Russia is going to be here in Venezuela and be on the doorstep of the United States. Because Venezuela is at the top of South, Af South America. In the Cold War, the country that stressed the United States the most was Cuba, right here. Um, the Cuban Missile Crisis, Cuba was a soft underbelly and became a major point of tension in the Cold War. Uh, the one point where we really could have had a hot nuclear war was because the United States did not want the Soviet Union having a sphere of influence so close to its borders. Venezuela isn't quite as close, but it's about as close as they're going to get. And for the same reasons, it's a strategic sphere of influence. Venezuela first erupted in protest in 2014. Much of these spheres of influence you can see particularly escalating in 2014. If it's not 2014, it's 2011. Syria, for example, um, 2011, the civil war starts. 2014, America becomes involved in that region. So you have 2011 as important, but 2014 particularly is when these spheres of influence blew up. In 2014, protest in Venezuela, the man who led those protests is in prison and another protege of his takes his place, Juan Guaido. This is the opposition leader in Venezuela. He took the place of Leopoldo Lopez, who was leading the protests in 2014. 2019, that blows open again and Russia starts sending aid to Maduro. March 23rd, the same day ISIS collapses, Russian troops arrive in Venezuela. So you've got um, ISIS collapse and Russian troops arrive in Venezuela, 2019, right? Yeah, that blows up again, 2019. So March 23 of 2019, when ISIS, the day that ISIS collapses, Russia sends troops arrive, arrive in Venezuela. The same day a tanker arrives as well with particular, chemi particular chemicals that Maduro could not get because of Russian sanctions. He needed, a certain, certain he needed certain goods to continue the oil economy of Venezuela. US sanctions blocked him um, receiving those needed goods. So Russia or Rosneft sent through a filled tanker. They may have filled it in South Africa. And then they sailed across. They arrived in Venezuela, propping up the economy as well. In 2014, Russian troops start getting observed in Sudan as well as Libya. They now have Russian troops on the ground, Sudan down here, as well as the financial support. We won't go into all that happened in 2019 in these countries. It was done in Australia, December 2019, and in Kenya, and over December and January of 2019 to 2020. But all of this relates to the Battle of Rafia, which was 
a fight between the North and the South over spheres of influence, separate to themselves. That was solid Eastern Front. Rafia was not an internal civil war. So this is Battle of Rafia. It's the Eastern Front. That is just a few of the spheres of influence. You could also speak about last year's efforts by Putin to influence many countries throughout Africa with his first Russian-African summit. We could speak about his efforts in Ukraine last year, but last year, Vladimir Putin had major victories through all of these spheres of influence that we have mentioned and others, and it fulfilled the Battle of Rafia. So who can explain a summary of the Battle of Rafia then? Or give us a give us a, a summary of what the difference is between the Western Front and the Eastern Front of World War Three. Somebody want to take a stab at it? Well, I'll try again. Okay. So battle, the Battle of Rafia is the battle between um, the King of the North and the King of the South be, uh, for the spheres of influence. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and in the meantime, all the innocent people are getting killed over oil and power. <clears throat> so, the United States, the King of the North, wants to, you know, have their strategic location. Um, so they're, so they're having their people through proxy war, uh, and 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 Russia, either through proxy war, uh, them the, Russia supporting their own. Uh, people through proxy war, or sounds like in Venezuela and Libya, they're actually having their troops, not just by proxy, but their their boots uh, are on, on the land of these uh, different countries like Venezuela and Libya. So it's all about the spheres of influence, and. Um, you know, just like Russia doesn't want the NATO to be so close, which is happening in Ukraine. Um, the, Russia now is, wants to be as close to NATO as possible. And that's why uh, Venezuela and uh, Venezuela and Libya are uh, an ideal place for them to control. So it's all about control of the, it's all about spheres of influence. Um, and so far up to this, <clears throat> up to this report, this presentation, it sounds like Russia is having the upper hand. Yeah, because the Battle of Rafia was a win for the King of the South. Yes, and that was for uh, up to that point. So on the line of World War III, that was the Eastern, that's the Eastern Front. And so on the line of World War III, what's the Western Front? Well, the Western Front is the internal, the civil war in, inside, inside the country, right? Just like in 1989, the civil war, internal unrest was in the Soviet Union, uh, which was successful in breaking them apart. And now uh, the Western Front is in the United States, a uh, civil war that we're fighting amongst each other. And what's the purpose of civil war and revolution? Purpose, to gain control, spheres of influence. 
Uh, no. I think Western Front. It's, it's to set up that dictatorship in place. Right, right. To overturn the establishment. So two separate things have two separate like when like when uh, in World War One and World War Two, where Germany fought on two fronts. Um, World War Three is a war on two fronts: the United States versus the United States, the civil war within, to overturn the establishment and set up a, establish a dictatorship, and war on the Eastern Front everything that fell just redescribed over spheres of influence. And here's the board work. This was from Kenya, I believe, um, from 2014 to 2019, where you have the, the, um, the wins for the King of the South. Basically a lot of the details, we didn't go through all of them. So what we need to see is that these things were fulfilled. Everything else that we expected to see fulfilled in 2019, we have visibility on except for November 9 itself. We expected the Battle of Rafia and that was fulfilled. We were expecting an impeachment and that was fulfilled. We were expecting the restraint of Islam, radical Islam, that was fulfilled. What we don't understand is November 9, but we know what we're looking for. It's internal civil war. You do not see the King of the South visible at, the, at that way mark. So someone asked a question, the Battle of Panium, which is also over cold Syria, will it occur in the year 2021 and not on a date? And Elder Tess answered, yes like with Rafia, it would be a period of time. And now she's been laying that out, the, um, the year of 2021, where you see that it was Zelensky, she uses the word poke, provoked, poked um, Putin first by starting to take down the oligarchs. And, um, and that was prompted by pressure that Biden was putting on Zelensky to get rid of the corruption. So Zelensky starts to go after the oligarchs, which, um, irritates Putin. And so 2021 was this back and forth of um, culminating in Ukraine. So you can already see the buildup to that. In Libya, in the last few months, Haftar, Haftar is doing badly. The end of the last year, he made major advancements and was winning. By the time you come to the last few months, he has had to pull right back. And he, it's also been suggested that Vladimir Putin has already started needing to remove troops out of Libya. Yemen is struggling. Venezuela, Maduro is struggling more than ever before. Syria, there, ha, are, Syria, there are new sanctions on Assad. His internal loyalty, even within his own family, is crumbling. You can already see Vladimir Putin begin to lose his grip with these fears of, fears of influence. So talking about Panium, we know that we know that here at Rafia 2019 is a win for the King of the South. And we see that fulfilled here. Rafia is fulfilled with all these spheres of influence and the um, power and control that, that Putin had gained. Um, but going into 2020 and then leading into 2021, he's losing and having trouble with all these spheres of influence. And then you get into um, 2021, which we just described. Um, with the issues in Ukraine. So what happens to the King of the South at Panium? Just the basic, what's Panium mark the King of the South with? Losing control of the spheres of influence. Yeah, what, what, prophetically, what do, we, what do we call that? Deadly wound. A deadly yeah. wound, yeah. Deadly wound. So we should be watching these external events, but there's other reasons that we should be watching the external events. The reason for that is empathy. If I was to be actively protesting right now, I honestly don't know what I would protest for. 
I'd have to stand in front of our parliament. I don't know how big that board would need to be. Go and look up what's happening in these countries. Look up Obama's predator drone program, what he did in Pakistan, in Libya, in Yemen, in Syria with these drone strikes. An article was put up on the media broadcast. This was July 10th, 2020. It spoke about these US military strikes through Syria. What they were able to investigate and reveal was that the civilian death toll, the innocent civilians killed by mistakes made in these strikes, whether by aircraft or drone, was 31 times the official number. So there's a link there for anybody that wants to check that out. So these are drone strikes by the United States. What this article does is take you through the stories of the people that lived in these countries, the survivors who continue to live in the wreckage of these countries. And you see the pictures of Ukraine. It's heartbreaking to see the destruction that is happening. But this is talking about the destruction that even the United States does. And read what has been done, not just by the United States and by Russia, by their own dictatorships, by Assad, by the influence of Saudi Arabia and Iran, any attempt to make this earthly kingdom better, make the United States, the earthly kingdom better, I think we would see as the hopeless cause that it is. It's like someone described to me a hose with a leak. You want to put your thumb over that leak and three more bursts open. It's horrific to read about these innocent lives. Part of the reason that FFA could not understand the Battle of Rafia last year and understand these spheres of influence is because the FFA worldview is Libya who? Libya where? Who cares about what's happening in Yemen? Who even knows where to find Yemen on a map? It's that nationalistic worldview that places the importance of the lives and citizens of one country over the lives and citizens of another country that causes their blindness to see the external events correctly. They calculated, I think it was in Pakistan last year, and, um, but last year, the United States killed more innocent lives in Pakistan than the Taliban. The United States is supposed to be there to free them from the Taliban. They're killing more innocent people. So are they there for the Taliban or not? If you go back and you read their stories, it hurts. But when you do that, when you understand the degree of pain, you'll understand why this movement and the setting up of another kingdom is the only hope that this world has. So to try to do anything with this earthly kingdom is hopeless. The only hope for the people of this world is to do the work that God's called us to do and setting up this kingdom. I know it hurts. Part of the reason that we're hurting is because people have finally seen the need to be vaccinated. We should not need to be vaccinated against the pain that we feel ourselves. And I know what it feels like to live in a sexist movement that belongs to a sexist church in a sexist country in a sexist society that has practiced sexism for 6,000 years, justified by the word of God and called it a positive good. I know what that is like. I know what it's like to feel abuse from that. I don't need vaccination from my own pain, for my own pain. When you need vaccination, it's because there is something separate to your own experience, separate to what you feel in your own gender, in the color of your own skin in your own country and nationalism to look outside and see the pain of somebody else. We need to be able to do that broadly. So, you know, it's interesting because I used to, way back before I was part of this movement, and I watched Walter Reif and all that. I remember watching um, the, all the videos about music and how um, bad it was. But I was a big movie watcher. And uh, it was like, to me, the videos that I watched on music were like a vaccine against music to really cure you of wanting to partake in the music of the world. And then, then some videos came out about movies and you know, I would look at it completely different than I, do, than I did then. But 
it was still this this message that we're give, getting, this message that we're understanding and seeing the suffering and seeing the pain that all of this, all of these battles over spheres of influence and the revolutions, all that we're seeing and all the pain and suffering that it brings, seeing the pain and suffering brings it, uh, it is, is like a vaccine on us. And it's kind of like what I was thinking, what I was trying to describe earlier about abortion before we, I think it was before we started, but about abortion, that if people could step outside their own tunnel vision of, of, of abortion being the murder of an innocent child and look at all the different pieces involved, look at the suffering of, of women, um, it, whether it be because of rape, whether it be because she can't afford a child, what, you know, the, the husband's left or it's just a boyfriend, an abusive boyfriend or whatever it is, all the different causes and, and uh, that if they could look at some of, some of that to be a vaccine to them, to be able to look outside their own mindset. Um, so anyways, this message and to see the suffering that is caused by all these things in the world is to be like a vaccine on us that would cure us from thinking that we're ever going to try to change this earthly world. I will have more confidence in the direction people are taking in this movement when I see them post the stories of the innocent lives lost in Pakistan, in Syria, in Libya, in Yemen, in Venezuela, because of both internal dictatorships, internal problems when we speak about India, about what the Hindu nationalistic government is doing to the Muslim population. What did they just do in Kashmir? What did Israel do to the West Bank, in the West Bank? This is the vaccination the pain that is outside the things that we feel ourselves. It is universal, it is global in its context. And when we can see and feel that to the degree that we should, the value of a life in Syria, when his entire body is smashed up, when he just lost his wife, his daughter and his son, normal people, because an American drone said, there's an ISIS compound nearby. This house looks good enough, essentially. Watching them rebuild their bodies and their lives without their family members. We should have that degree of vaccination when we truly see that it hurts, but we will not be tempted to remove ourselves from this movement because we will recognize the only hope that these innocent people have in countries where this movement doesn't even have a single representing priest will be that we set them up a kingdom they can join. They don't have that hope in their countries. We're setting up a kingdom for their sakes, not for our own sakes. A kingdom where a woman in Yemen, a man in Syria, a family in Pakistan can find a home where they can find proper treatment, where people do not have the freedom to hurt each other. That's the kingdom that we're setting up. It comes with restrictions of freedom, because if there was no restrictions, people would abuse their power. That's the kingdom we need to focus on. And that's an interesting statement right here, this last one, when you look at the Vespers classes and what we're understanding about freedom versus equality, that it comes with restrictions of freedom. Freedom with restraint, liberty with restraint, liberty with rules eat from all the trees of the garden, which is God's government, or eat from the one tree that he said don't partake of, which represents total freedom and Satan's government. Because if there was no restrictions, people would abuse their power. And so that freedom that they exercise, that, that freedom that they exercise brings pain and suffering on others. And I don't remember if it was Sarah or Mary or somebody that mentioned it's pure selfishness. And what we need to focus on is God's kingdom. 
and setting that kingdom up for him, that our lives would be that living sacrifice to do the work that God has blessed us with the privilege and opportunity to do. So we'll read her prayer and then close. Almighty God, we know at the cross what killed Christ. What hurt Christ's heart more than anything else was bearing the sin of the whole world. We look at our experience now, Lord, in a parable sense, we're to do that. We're to look at the sin of the whole world and it hurts. It breaks our hearts. It's universal. It's global. We see the suffering and the pain. Lord, may we see the hope that is in this movement, that is in the setting up, not just of a church, but a kingdom, not just a church, but what will also be a state. A place that people can live with freedom, that they won't fear Obama's predator drones over their heads in the sky where they can't even see them. They won't live in such fear that there will be no ISIS fainting women who faint at the sight of anything that reminds them of what they endured. Where genital mutilation in South Sudan, where women bleed to death, that there will, be, there will no longer be practiced because you have rules. May we be willing to abide in a country that does not practice freedom to hurt, freedom to abuse. We don't understand sin as you do. Whatever restrictions you desire to place on us to bring us to this kingdom, may we accept because you are wise. You see all, we do not. So if you tell us to do something that we don't want to do, that we feel violates our freedom, may we trust your eyes and not our own. That's what, it, that's what is meant to let go of earthly support and trust you as you are revealed in parable teaching. Lord, we are in a crisis in this movement. This vaccination process hurts. It hurts to bear the sin of the whole world, and it's nothing compared to what Christ personally endured. But we are required to have our eyes open and see it. I pray that every head bowed, those, Lord, who did not stay and finish watching, those who have left, those who will no longer watch, Lord, I pray that they might be saved, that they might join us in that kingdom. May we do everything in our power to convince them the right way. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Anybody have any comments? I think I understand the revolutions and everything now. So thank you for um, going through this again. I, I like the way you presented it with um, so many questions where we had to. Was I wanted to do a whole lot more, but I didn't have time to prepare it. <laughs> yeah, I understand. It takes a lot of time to think of the questions. and. Yeah. Yeah, yeah because I've been listening, re-listening to this presentation throughout the week as well. And there was one day, well, you already know some of what went on this week for me. Yeah. <laughs> and it was one of those days that I was listening to it. And I thought, oh, I need to open that file and go through and change this and change that and put that question in there. And we need to be able to answer these questions, you know, and 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 I just I can't do it. <laughs> I couldn't do it. So some of it I did as I when I initially made it, but I just realized when I listened to it again how much um, different it could have been because we really need to we just really need to be able to be fluent in in these concepts, you know. Yes. And um and there are many concepts to be fluent in, but this one was to me was especially touching to um, really think about the pain and the suffering that people are going through and the, and the work, the, I don't know if I know the right adjective, but to really understand the blessing of what God has called us to be a part of. And it's not about protesting in front of some Capitol building. It's about 
knowing all that that goes on and all that pain and suffering, the vaccination that 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 cures us from wanting to go try and fix the broken governments, but instead our focus be on setting up God's kingdom and preparing the place for them to come to. And she did mention also in the prayer, um, let me pull that back up. I know I've heard it before, but um, in, in, in my mind has been there on this, but she pointed out, let's see, that it would be a church state. Where did she say that? Um, You're almost there. Oh, yeah, I think you skipped it. You, you just missed it. It says, not just a church, but what will also be a state. Oh, yeah, there you go. Not just, yeah. yeah. And, you know, I've, I've thought about that a over the past several months for a while now um, about it being a church state because and, and I don't know how this I don't know the church state is um, how do you describe how how have we described the church state relationship between um, like Rome and its armies is that the way to say it? huh Oppressive? No, that's not the word I'm looking for. That's, um, but that is what they. That's the result of it. But it's a, it's a marriage, right? Yeah, it's a marriage. They're in. They're fornicating, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, well, I don't know if that's right to say it that way. Fornicating and marriage don't go hand in hand. But there's a relationship between them. There's a marriage, a union, a union. And um, you go back to the Garden of Eden. So the example. Yeah, when the two become one flesh, right? So, um, and it's all representing, if I understand correctly, it's representing this church union, um, marriage. That God's true kingdom is true. It's a true and right church and state marriage or relationship, union. Yeah, so that m makes me better understand. You know, you know, when the Israelites wanted a king. You know, that what? Say that again. When the when the Israelites wanted a king. Yeah. At the time of Samuel, you know, I I I, I didn't quite understand then why God allowed it. No, and I'm beginning to understand a little better now. You know, because it is, you know, it's he, he wanted as much as possible a relationship. You know, and, and he told Samuel, you know, let them have a king because they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting me as you know, as as their um relations and however we want to you know phrase that nowadays uh, but they were rejecting god as as the husband as the wife as the relations as the as the partner you know they were they were rejecting because they wanted they wanted total freedom and um he he because because God wanted their relationship, He allowed it until you know. I mean, until we know His forbearance is going to. I mean, we know it's going to be so bad that you know, like just like He divorced His people, you know, it's going to be so bad that it for His forbearance is going to come to a stop. So, what did He do at the cross? What happened at the cross? That was that was pure selflessness. Um, yeah, but there, you know. there was something else I was looking for. Yes, that too. Um, what did he say about Caesar?
render to Caesar what is Caesar's? And render to God what is God's. Well, what did he do? What did who do? Jesus? Yeah, what did, what did God do at the cross then? He, he rendered to God. I mean, yeah. this is this this was God's will. So, in order to restore the relationship, he was willing to be totally selfless and and take our punishment. Yeah, but there's a particular thing, and and I don't remember which presentations. I know I did the notes on some of them. But she marks at the cross. There was this um, um, trying to think of the words that she used. Um, so I'm going to use my words. I think there was a significant change in the government at the cross. Because the curtain was wrapped and and leadership changed over, even though they didn't realize it yeah that too but what what does it say what does he mean when he says render to caesar what is caesar's and to god what is god the phrase we know that we know the phrase well he had back at the time with samuel when they're asking for a king they no longer wanted a theocracy so what does a theocracy represent State. Say that again. State. Quote. Separation of church and state is what yes. you're asking. Yes. Separation of church and state at the cross. So, and he divorces his people, right? So that must have meant there was a marriage or covenant relationship, right? So, She's mentioned, and I don't remember the words that she used it in, but she mentions it, like I said, I can't remember the words, but she called, referred to it as a significant change. And then at the end, there would be a significant change. And that prayer just kind of seemed to me to mention what I've been thinking um, is that it'll be a true church and state relationship. So can we... So can we uh, bring in the Sabbath and give God what we need to give God? You better. Will you go ahead? Thank you. Thank you, most holy and merciful and mighty God. We stand humble before you, Lord. On the eve, on the the beginning of your holy day, we give our hearts to you, Lord. But you already own them, so all we can do is pray, and we pray that you uh, bless us with your Holy Spirit and your holy presence on the Sabbath day. And we thank you for all that you've done in our lives. And we uh, ask for mercy, Lord, because we are stiff necked and, and uh, slow to understand the, the light you have put forth. But we ask for your continued patience with us, Lord. And we thank you for your love and your mercy. And we pray all this in your holy and mighty name. In the name of Yahshua, Jesus, the Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lane.